Right. Uh, welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, I'm delighted to have Jake White here today talking about hamming and scientific discovery. Take it away, Chuck. Sure, thanks, for con um, thanks for having me. And um, what I'm going to do here as far as format in my discussion or my initial presentation rather is, uh, is go through a set of PowerPoint slides. So um, just give me a moment to share my screen and pull that up, and then I'll, uh, I'll get started. All right. So, Shrikant, just confirm you can see my slides, correct? Looks good. Okay. Um, well, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in today. Um, so this is um, a talk about uh, something I wrote about recently that I think resonated with Shrikant, and he thought might make a good topic for, uh, for this group. Um, is, uh, is about uh, Richard Hamming, um, great scientist from the 20th century, mathematician, and, um, and other scientists in general, um, and, and the way they discovered ideas. Um, this has sort of been, uh, Shrikant and I were speaking before the meeting, this has been a bit of a theme of mine the last few months. Um, yes, it's one thing to learn the sort of great ideas from as many different disciplines as possible, which is definitely a theme for me, um, but it's actually another to learn and try to try to understand the context and, and the way at which many of these scientists arrived at these ideas is actually, um, it's a different, it's a different way to look at things and, and I've learned a lot from it. So um, hopefully I can share some of that with you. Um, so before we go into uh, uh, Richard, just, just a bit about myself. Um, occasional, definitely moonlight here in this, in this, in this group. Um, I've got a background in math, but I'm um, currently uh, focused a lot of my time in, in like investing and in entrepreneurship and technology, which is kind of where my day job is. Um, my sort of purpose, if you will, is, is definitely to learn and create, or another way to say that is learn to build. Um, so a lot of my waking thoughts, you know, just tend to be centered around productivity, um, you know, how to learn, how to learn more, how to build better. Um, and so in that sense, uh, Richard, who I'll tell you about next, uh, Richard Hamming, um, is, is a sort of kindred spirit of mine. Um, American mathematician, um, it worked at Bell Labs, which was uh, sort of this, this focal point for a lot of scientific creativity in the, in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and most notable for the creator of coding theory um, and error correcting codes, which is, turns out to be at the foundation of a lot of, essentially all of modern communications. And the reason why, you know, for example, you pick up the phone and things are pretty reliable. Um, so I recently came across him and, and his life, um, and more particularly his famous talk, You and Your Research, um, which he first delivered in 1986, um, as, as his book on a similar topic was actually just recently republished this year. Um, and in that book, which is called the art of doing science and engineering. Um, he slew, he shared like this this pretty large slew of lessons about um, what he takes, what what he thinks it takes, in his opinion, um, to do first class original work um, in one's occupation. And of course, his home turf is science and mathematics. But um, reading it, I really felt that um, these lessons apply pretty broadly, no matter what your your domain is, where where you want to build, or where you want to do creative work. Um, so with that, um, what I'll do is, is go through um, a variety of Hamming's ideas. I'll focus mostly on what I learned from him initially, and then I think Shrikant and I will do a little bit of two-way discussion, and then maybe we'll try to broaden these ideas a little bit. Um, but in general, what I learned from Hamming, I think, can be categorized. Um, into two, two different sides, um, sort of internal traits, you know, having that, the right stuff, so to speak, um, and I've listed them out here. And then uh, second, the external focus. Given you have this sort of internal you know, traits, um, how do you choose to spend your time and, and maybe what are some ways to, to think about focus um, so that you, you give yourself the greatest opportunity to do really first-class work, um, creative work. So I'll step through each of these uh, sequentially the way I've written out them out here. Besides the grouping, I just, just suggested there isn't really too much of a particular order to them, um, but just in order, I'll, I'll, I'll step through them. So that first trait that I had listed um, is, is self-confidence. And, and Mr. Hamming has got, uh, Dr. Hamming rather, has got um, some, some interesting things to say about self-confidence. And, uh, you know, I've, 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 I've 
copy or transcribe them here. Um, but, but there is a belief that you can do, you're capable of these things and, and maybe pay a little less attention to the mistakes I and mean, learning, learning from your mistakes. And uh, as others might suggest that, that, you know, a little less so than think common, common belief is. And if I have anything to add here about, you know, this, this element of, um, of maybe what it takes is, is that I think my internal calculus, if you will, is that there's a sort of asymmetry to pursuing great ideas. Um, if you fail, you know, you have failed ideas. Well, your, your downside is actually fairly limited. Um, you know, you sort of, these, these failed ideas sort of die quick deaths under heavy scrutiny internally, or if you go public with them and they don't work out, they're just sort of lost to the dustbin of history. And it's, you know, really, I mean, the fatalist view is it's kind of, it doesn't really matter anyway. Right. Um, but, um, on the flip side, if you pursue a great idea or you know, go after some, some very well-known hard problem and you succeed, well, you know, these the, the sort of greatest scientific ideas have, have outlived their creators by hundreds or even thousands of years. So, you know, on a risk reward kind of basis, like the, the sort of upside of pursuing you know, great ideas is it far outweighs the, the cost of going after them and maybe not, it not working out. Um, so, so there's some self-confidence and also some, some odds in your, in your, some outcomes in your favor in, in this regard. And that, that second trait that, uh, Hamming identified that, that I, that I could pick out as well is, um, an implicit notion of, well, I couldn't find any direct quotes from, from Richard, which is why I actually have this one from James Watson here, who's a, another pretty notable scientist from the 20th century. But, um, there's definitely an implicit theme, a pretty persistent one of, ambition throughout Hamming's work. Um, I almost, I view it as, you don't, you don't just, like the self-confidence is, is necessary, but not sufficient. You actually have to have a pretty big internal drive or internal desire to go out there and sort of demonstrate that self-confidence um, to, do, to do really first class work. So, you know, this is obviously, sometimes people have conflicted beliefs about ambition, you know, whether or not it's a net negative or a net positive in the world. Um, I'm certainly in the latter camp um, where I feel it's not evil, it's not selfish, it ends up being, uh, it can be expressed perhaps in these ways, but um, on balance, it's, it, it, uh, it's a net good for society. And I like to think about, you know, through, through one great rower or through one rower, a, a great ship was turned, I think is a good metaphor um, for, for the power of uh, an individual's impact, the, cap the potential impact an individual can have on the world. Um, so with that, let me let me move on to the the third slide here um, around what, what it takes from internal from an internal perspective um, is persistence. Um, to some extent, this is is definitely cliche. Um, you know, we all know the the story maybe about Edison, Thomas Edison, early twentieth century, who you know tried over ten thousand different combinations of metal alloys to get the right filament for for the light bulbs, um, but. Um, I actually like the way that, that Hamming characterized persistence, where there's also a compound interest to be had, a compound interest way to view persistence. Just, you know, one extra hour a day, if you assume you increase or you improve at 6% an hour, you didn't quite have the right answer there, you didn't know, um, neither do we for that matter. But um, th that steady accumulation, a bit more effort every day um, can add up to pretty great totals over a lifetime. Um, there's actually a book out there called The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson, published about 15 years ago that um, was on pretty much the same topic that stuck with me pretty deeply for quite a while. Um, so with that, I'm gonna move on to the second category I identified from, from Dr. Hamming, um, which is around, okay, so if, assuming you have the internal side of things taken care of when it comes to doing really great creative work, um, what are some maybe more tactical and more external ways that um, you might pursue this? Um, you know, what, what does it take externally? Um, Richard had an, an interesting idea, an interesting sort of routine actually, um, which I really identified with um, around, you know, setting, just setting aside Friday afternoons to do what, what he says, do the great thoughts. Um, 
uh, I think the great thoughts rather, he said, put away the telephone, so to speak, or and so in our day, it might be the smartphone or whatever, and, and, and think about, you know, basically the biggest questions he could. Um, and, and what I feel the, the sort of underlying driver of that or why it makes sense is regular reflection um, and an open mind, you know, keeps you, I think, up to date on, on your field, on the state of your field. Um, and, and it just gives you, you're constantly re-examining it, I think, from slightly different ways, uh, week in, week out, or day in, day out. Um, it, you're eventually going to happen to look at it from the right one. Um, and, and that's where some pretty big doors or pretty, pretty big ideas might, might come out. Um, and the second thing that, that Richard pointed out about, I think, more external uh, conditions or external uh, principles of really tough, not creative work, um, is around the right questions. And, and what I've written here on this slide is actually um, a sort of anecdotal story I, I first heard all the way back in undergrad, a good number of years ago now, uh, about a first class uh, mathematician who basically said it pretty much as such that if he has any, if he attribute any one thing for his success is that like Richard, he would keep his mind focused on the big ideas and basically keep a list of 10 to 20 important problems in his pocket at any time, so to speak, and compare everything he saw against those things for any sort of glimmer of insight into one of these pretty important problems. And a handful of times in his career, it, it, you know, something sparked and, and, and he was able to make a pretty significant breakthrough in his field. Um, so that's something I think about quite a bit and, and try to try to apply in my day to day when it comes to doing my best, you know, in a, in a creative setting. Um, and, and maybe also one more thing to add about this is um, even if solving maybe an important problem or finding a great idea isn't your explicit goal, um, I think that this habit here on the slide is a pretty powerful one and, and might make you despite your, you know, your interest or lack thereof, uh, the, the lucky one, so to speak, or what appears to be the lucky one, um, who has that, that out of the blue type breakthrough. Um, uh, that's maybe one more comment I would have about it. And then this, this last trait, um, which is, it's around timing. And I think it's a, it's a pretty unique insight um, around asking the question pretty often, what's just become possible? What's only recently become possible? Um, as I've sort of moved through, you know, the world, I guess, is I've realized, you know, not only is it important to ask the right questions, but also to ask them correctly, um, or ask them right, maybe is a less grammatically correct way, but it maybe has a, has a you know, more alliteration there. And, and what I mean by that is, can we rephrase answers we already understand, or maybe have only just recently come to understand? Can we rephrase them or, or view them from a different way to apply them to questions that we don't understand, um, which which uh, Hamming actually said he did quite a bit of, which is, you know, basically take things that have already been figured out and see if you can repackage that knowledge or view that knowledge in a different way to extend or broaden its application. Um, and, and the way I see that justified in the historical record is if you look at the history of like great scientific ideas, they seem to unfold sequentially or or like a story. Um, and that's actually not a coincidence, um, I think. I think it's that, um, you know, there, is, there, was, there was one breakthrough and then another individual came along and said, hmm, I think I can actually make, I can, I can apply that or, or bring it one step further um, into a new field or into a new domain um, or, or, or break down the next layer of the puzzle, so to speak. Um, so while the greatest ideas may be truly, truly original, um, I think that, Hamming and myself actually agree that a lot of first class work is sort of a ingenious reinterpretation or expansion on work that's come before. So, and, and timing is also critical to getting there first, right? So anytime somebody else around you or some, you know, somebody else in the world has, has actually come up with something new or some new brilliant insight or piece of mathematics, technology, whatever it may be, um, ask yourself, well, now that we figured this out collectively, um, what's possible what's possible next um that might be another great way to, to do some pretty first class work um so with that i'm going to pause here um because i am kind of at the end of the insights from hamming and i think uh, shrikan's going to have a few comments 
Um, yes, let's let's do that. Uh, can you right. stop sharing the screen for a moment? So we, let's talk about hamming a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so let me tell you my favorite um, anecdote about hamming. Okay. Um, so Richard Hamming was a mathematician at Bell Labs from 1940s through 1970s mm -hmm. who liked to sit down with strangers in the company cafeteria. Now, Bell Labs is a very significant organization, so there would be people from all kinds of fields working there at cutting edge problems. Okay, so we're talking about people like that. And he would ask them about their field of expertise, though he did not know much about it. He would ask them about that. At first, he would ask mainly about their day-to-day -day work, but eventually he would turn the conversation towards the big open questions. He would ask, what were the most important unsolved problems in their profession? Why did those problems matter? What kind of things would change when someone in the field finally broke through? What new potential would, it, would that unlock? After he had gotten them all excited and talking passionately, he would ask one final question. So, why aren't you working on that? Okay, I, this is, I love this because what it is, is that I think most people spend their time on all kinds of questions, all kinds of things. So this one, you know, I, you know it's called the Hamming question. It's about identifying the point of maximum leverage in whatever you're doing. Um, and I have found this to be a very powerful tool, not only while talking to other people, but more importantly, while talking to yourself. You know, you're trying to do a whole bunch of things and you keep asking to say, okay, what is it that really matters? And if you hit the point of the maximum leverage, well, you, have got, you got the maximum leverage. So that's my favorite story about Hamming. What do you think? Yeah, that's um, it, it. Hemming did have the he had a penchant for being a bit of the the provocateur uh, wherever he sat because I think there is some backstory to his his anecdote of sitting down at those tables, which is after he he being a mathematician. After a while, he found himself not welcome at the physicist table. Um, he actually and then he started spending time with the chemists. Um, so yes, yeah, so there is a bit of um, well, I think that the way I actually might. I might draw a connection to what I presented earlier was, um, you know, if, if, if that, if there's an element of, of, provoc of pro provocation to, to Hamming's question, um, it's somehow, maybe it's associated in some way with that role of ambition uh, where, you know, you might, you might not be so tolerant or, you know, so, um, so accommodating of, of others or yourself, most importantly, uh, working on the smaller questions when when there is uh when there are much greater ones to be tackled um and by that i mean of course not everybody's going to be long for that sort of ride but um you know by and large i think you're going to raise raise the output and raise the standards of others around you at the same time you are yourself that does take a bit of um what do we say maybe thick skin to to, to get pe folks there but um but uh it's uh i think it does bring out the best in everyone in the long term yeah, no, I, absolutely. And the other, other part I find interesting, uh, and that was there in one of the quotes that you said was about closed doors and open doors, mm -hmm. because it's the same issue. Because what happens is that if you are in conversation with great people working on great problems, that is actually a very good input. Not, not only you can contribute by asking questions, you get a lot you can see perspectives that you had not seen. You see connections to what you're working on thanks to talking to these people. So I think there are, you know, there are a handful of people who are like that. And of course, uh, some of the great example, I forget what his name was. There was a mathematician who would keep doing this. And of course, the most infamous character doing this was, um, infamous, infamous, um, was uh, Johnny Von Neumann. You know, he, he, yes. he drove people nuts. Because not only would he do this, he would actually solve the problem. He would just walk into different places and mm. 
asked people what their problems were and actually saw them, you know, because he had, you know, he had, his, his mind was much more, uh, you know, much, much more expansive. So, uh, so, so wonderful. So just wanted to talk to tell you about uh, what I know about Hamming, but let me hand it back to you. Uh, you're going to talk. Uh, so you, you, you said that you've been focused on, looking at various scientists for the past couple of months and looking, mm. studying the process of their discovery. What have you learned? Right. Um, let me actually pull up because I did put a little second part together that I thought would organize my thoughts a bit. Um, so let me pull that up. So, so like, like Shrikan has said, um, it's definitely been a theme for me as of late to, um, you know, go, go sort of to the meta layer of, okay, I spent some time studying quite a few great ideas across many disciplines, but what may actually be most relevant to me um, is, is the sort of process behind which those were discovered. Um, really is a fresh way, I think, to view things and, and you can actually learn a lot of lessons um, independent of the ideas themselves about how they were actually discovered. So um, this connects back to definitely a big thing of mine, and I think Shrikan says as well, around multidisciplinary thinking. Um, so some of you, you know, definitely Shrikan might be familiar with my my proud sort of self-label as an ardent generalist, um, you know, where I'm trying to pick up as many of these fundamental ideas from different, different disciplines as possible to have in, in the mental toolbox, so to speak. Um, and in particular, so as of late, like I mentioned, I've been on a, I've been on a, a quite a kick, you know, reading about the about the process of discovery. Um, and I've actually focused, I actually have a book here with me, um, quite a bit on the advent of uh, complexity theory. There's a pretty well known book by an author named uh, Mitch Mitch Waldrop um, about complexity theory, which is pretty unique and differentiated um, among the different fields of science, I think, because it's really just been, it's really just come about in, in its present form, or really as a, as a field at all in the last 40 years. Um, and the scientists there and some of the leading thinkers in the field um, actually sort of founded it by asking that question I'd referenced earlier, which is what's just become possible? Um, because what complexity theory is about, well, it's a little bit out of the scope, but basically what they've been able to do is, 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 find common patterns across many different biological and physical systems. And the way they're able to sort of tease out these, these common patterns of, of emergence um, is actually through computation. So there's a pretty well-known institute out in New Mexico called the Santa Fe Institute, where it's sort of the, uh, the high temple of complexity theory, if you will. And it's, 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 presence in New Mexico is actually not a coincidence. Um, it comes from its proximity to Los Alamos, New Mexico, which is host of a, a large, you know, government research facility that, that was sort of um, on the leading edge of applied computation in the, in the mid to late 20th century. So these scientists figured out, well, now we actually have pretty good computers. We're able to um, run simulations of things we haven't before. What's just become possible? What can we do with that? And turned out, you know, the newest, probably the newest, most exciting field, and one of the most exciting fields out there in the domain of science. Um, so to make that concrete with a few examples, um, physicist or rather computer scientist named John Holland um, asked a really interesting cross-disciplinary question, which only became possible with computers, about what computer programs look like if they are created by evolution. <laughs> um, pretty exotic idea, but he came up with genetic programming which is actually a fairly effective technique um, in some domains for finding some, some really interesting answers. Um, Stuart Kaufman went, went the other way and asked what if genes were treated like, you know, like uh, molecular genes um, were treated like molecular computers and came up with gene regulation and autocatalytic sets, which well, fairly, you know, it's somewhat of a esoteric concept. It's actually one of the most compelling ones I've ever heard for the origin of life, which is, Talk about a pretty great problem, pretty pretty big idea. Um, and there's a few other examples that, that the book goes into pretty great detail on. Um, looking on as well into 
definitely more in the economic or business realm, uh, particularly around innovation and entrepreneurship, which is also something I think about quite a bit and is, I find fairly fascinating as a, as a process of discovery, um, is that the, the sort of scientific process of discovery, I think, is, is very closely related to innovation in the economic realm. Um, going back to that that notion of persistence james dyson most people know him as the vacuum guy but he's actually a pretty accomplished uh all-around engineer built over five thousand prototypes of his vacuum cleaner before he brought it to market um uh, another one out there is uh is um well how to foster innovation rather um as far as like first class creative work you know um google is actually uh, a company that you know, as far as technology innovation, just from a pure perspective there, I, um, they really have quite the track record. And one of their core principles that they articulate and they do their best to, to foster within their company is, is called managed chaos, um, which is where they know that they can't really mandate from the top down, like somebody please make the next great advance in computer science next week or by the end of next quarter, we need to have it done. Um, so instead what they do is, um, have a pretty dedicated split um, between time spent on their regular day to day and and sort of time to think the great thoughts I think is how, is how uh, Hamming would characterize it um, where they spend some fraction of their time actually about 20 percent working on maybe off the wall ideas um, but but that are an intentional break from their day to day um, to try to try to foster some sort of a breakthrough or, or advance in, in their um, um, in, in their in their in their business, um, so with that, that's uh, that's actually the end of my slide here. I'll bore you all too many of those, but um, if anybody's interested, this, these are some of the works that I've referenced, both either explicitly or implicitly. Uh, and Ashraf Khan, you asked about this before the for the pitch. So, in short, um, excuse me for the presentation. So, in short, you know, this is what I've been reading. Um, in particular, I would say. Well, of course, our focus has been on Hamming's book, which is the first listed there. But there's this really fascinating uh, set of interviews by, put out by Discover Magazine over the last 15 years that it's just dozens and dozens of interviews with really top-notch scientists, uh, written in every man, sort of every language. They're not overly technical or anything like that, um, but, uh, but that I've gotten a lot out of and found a sort of free compilation of. So um, we'll try to make that available. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. Uh, can you stop sharing this uh, screen mm -hmm. so we can? All right. Wonderful. So what we are going to do is we're just going to uh, go. Uh, Sanjay has amazing things to say. So Sanjay uh, next. Sanjay followed by Jeff. Sanjay, go ahead. Oh, just a second. I have to allow you to unmute, uh, allow everybody to unmute themselves. Uh, go ahead, Sanjay. So I, um, I, yeah, this is a fantastic talk. Um, I am really um, excited about this topic. Um, so I, I just uh, wanted to ask the, the question that I asked at the end. I made some comments in the chat, but the comment, the question I had was that uh, we have we have a lot of people, um, especially in physics and mathematics, working on on problems that together are, are classified as the theory of everything problem. It's basically an equation which uh, you know should, in theory, um, explain everything in the universe. So uh, the question is, what do you believe will be the consequence when we actually arrive at such an equation uh, that explains everything? And, and will, will, will we ever be able to? You know, it's a, it's a fascinating question. Um, and and I think first, thanks for your question, Ajay, or Sanjay, and your, and your enthusiasm. Much appreciated. Um, and it is a quite interesting question. And I actually just wrapped up a long-form podcast with a gentleman named Stephen Wolfram, a uh, pretty well-known physicist, uh, also accomplished technologist, and definitely one of the folks with the audacity to um, be focused on the, the theory of everything pretty explicitly. Um, and he actually just answered this question. And, and um, I think it's actually, it sheds, it sheds sort of light on the, enough light on the situation that I, would, that I sort of want to echo it, um, which is, well, he actually has a, a very interesting class of ideas about um, basically that our universe is just fundamentally computational, um, which means that while some someday we may be able to derive the mathematical set of equations that describe the computation, or you know some might refer to it the simulation, um, we may be able to derive them, but 
if we do, we would need a computer as big as the universe to run them. So while in some interesting way, we might be able to, you know, characterize the universe in a, maybe a set of equations if we're lucky, maybe if not, it looks more of like a somewhat, some kind of algorithm. Um, to make to make have it, to have it really have any meaning, you know, beyond its intrinsic worth, you would actually need to run the thing. But you need a, a universe, a computer as large as the universe. So, in some sense, you would have it. You would have the the theory, but would you be able to do so much with it? I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, and I actually find that uh, for whatever reason, it's a, it's uh, it's satisfying <laughs> that if that is the case, then you know, then life just goes on <laughs> is the short answer. Um, I don't think we'll ever be like, I don't think you're going to lose free will if all of a sudden you, you gain self-awareness about the whole universe sort of thing. Um, uh, next up is uh, Jeff. Jeff, go ahead. So thank you for this. This is really, it is really terrific and I think powerful. Um, one of the things that you didn't say that um, in my own experience, I've developed a healthier appreciation for than I ever had as a younger person um, is how um, that it's just essential to be pursuing uh, the answer to anything, expecting that you will fail many times in efforts or that you'll, you'll conduct many experiments and you'll be surprised by the end. And even if you don't, if you consider all of them a success because of what you learned, um, you still will go through tremendous iteration. And I would have, I would have expected that that would have been one of the core things um, there. And uh, maybe you could just say a little bit more about that, um, especially in this in this era we're in, where so many things have just been thrown up in the air, and where there are just seemingly almost impossible decisions to be made that have huge life and death consequences um, that we're having trouble making. Uh, and I think in some ways we're stalling because we're trying to find the one right answer rather than really moving aggressively and, uh, and being comfortable with, with, you know, with those results just, you know, and, and then iterating from there. Uh, Jack, would you like to respond to that? Sure, I can do my best. Um, Jeff, I hope you're, it's good to see you and I hope you're enjoying the uh, New York City evening out there, it looks like. Um, and yeah, you know what, it, it is interesting that Hamming in some sense, well, I suppose not, he wasn't totally opposed to the the prospect of like, um, do we, how do we reframe failure to, to find value in it? Because I do agree with you there, Jeff, that, um, you know, there, I, 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 it's a bit of another cliche, but there's only success and there's learning, right? Um, failure in a, in a word is often not the, uh, not the, not the best for, uh, for really characterizing anything. You either failed Which or of course, which of course assumes that you survive the, uh, the outcome. Yes. That's the, uh, probably the Taleb response. As long as you don't take too much existential risk, um, there is learning to be done. I, I agree with you there. Um, so, so yeah, the way, I probably would have the most perspective on that in a, in a business sense, which is, you know, if you're, if you're running a company or something like this and, and you've risked half your money and ha all of your time on one project and then it fails, well, like you said, you are out of the game, so to speak. But if you can find ways to experiment cheaply um, and to, uh, to give yourself many iterations before you fall out of the game, so to speak, then the relative cost of failure in each case is, is much smaller. And, but, but winning will still get you to where you want to be. Um, so that's, that's usually my heuristic, my, what I'm always trying to, well, I'm trying to maximize efficiency by minimizing cost. Um, if I have many small cost failures, that's okay. If I get a big winner at the end of it, um, they're, they're going to more than pay for themselves. Um, so I agree with you there, Jeff. Uh, thanks, uh, Jake. Uh, next up is Joe, followed by Ed. Joe, go ahead. Hi, thank you for this presentation. It was awesome. I really do uh, enjoy it. And I think that this really speaks to what Shurkan is trying to accomplish here with some topic learning. Um, you know, one of the things that you had mentioned is the 10 to 20 problems that, uh, you know, uh, Hemming would carry with him. 
And I thought that that was brilliant primarily because if you're thinking about problems that haven't been solved, you're just thinking differently. So you, it may enable you to solve the problems that you want to solve, like you're trying to solve anyway. That was just one comment. How did he maybe, how did he identify those 20 th problems was, is one question. And then I have another comment is that it, I found in philosophy that you may find a lot of answers also in business um, in the sense that like even thinking about a serenity prayer <laughs> that was uh, accept the things I can change the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the to difference. Know the difference. Uh -huh. And you know, the, the beauty in that is that if you can quantify that within a business framework, you have an answer of your optimum way of performing and moving forward. So mm -hmm. if you think about it, what I can change, what I can't change, and then the wisdom to know the difference between those two is actually gives you the parameters to make business decisions. So I found that to be fascinating because when you said he sat down at different tables, you know, and then quantifying that, I think is something where you can add analytics to a framework that actually works. But I, I would like to know uh, what your feelings are on two things, the idea of how philosophy maps into analytics, and also the other is uh, how he came up with those 20 questions that you had mentioned that he would always try to, you know, be answering. And, and, and uh, I pre sure. again, I appreciate everything. This is really exciting. Great, Joseph. I'm glad you enjoyed. Um, I'll take your second question first, which is how does he identify those questions? Um, it's interesting. That's, um, it seems to be a tradition in many sort of physical sciences to have these sort of, um, well, sometimes for better or worse, these, these great towering, like grandfather-like figures in the field that basically lay out a set of questions as a challenge to the next generation. Um, the most notable example of that, which uh, leaps to mind immediately for me, is in mathematics. There is a set of problems um, that a gentleman named David Hilbert laid out at the end of the 19th century in a pretty famous paper, and he called them, I think, the century problems or something like this. It was a list of about 10 to 20 problems um, that, that he felt were among the most important unsolved problems in mathematics. Um, and I think about 120 years later, we're, we're maybe halfway through the list um, thereabouts. So often these, these giants at the top of their fields will, will, um, will be proactive about saying, well, here they are, <laughs> so to speak. Here, here is everything I can figure out. I hope the next generation can do so. Um, and then it's just, um, it's up. It's 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 up to the uh, you know that that next set of individuals to be proactive about having them on on always uh, somewhere in in the top of mind. Um, so that's one way, and the other way, I suppose, is you know in the more average day to day, um, you could just go about well not day to day, but I would say week to week, writing down your questions, accumulating them, and maybe constantly re-examining that list, reprioritizing and saying, these really are the most important 10 questions I can be focused on answering at the moment. Um, that's more of my personal approach. I actually start, well, at least, you know, just about every work day or work week with, here's my most, here's my biggest open problems. How can I hammer away on them this week? <laughs> um, some of them have been around for quite a while, but, you know, it, it's a good reminder to have them uh, in, in, in your pocket, so to speak. Um, and your second question was, how does philosophy relate to analytics? Um, <laughs> I know you, you gave a pretty, you gave a concrete connection there. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's, it's obviously a fairly broad question, um, a fairly deep one at that. Uh, you know, can everything be quantified, so to speak? I'm not so sure. Um, but yeah, I try, definitely try as much as possible. Well, you know, within reason. Um, but yeah, actually, yeah, I don't have much. I don't have much on you, uh, much on that for you, unfortunately. Next yeah, I mean, is, it, it, no, this is what... all right, Jess. We'll, we'll continue this uh, in takeaways. Um, next up is Ed. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> hey, thank you very much, Jake. It was an excellent uh, talk. A very thought-provoking. What I really wonder is, we aren't that far away from uh, artificial and intelligence and when AI is 
developed to a, a certain point, won't it make uh, human endeavors uh, really kind of superfluous? That it will be, we will have devices that will, you know, d will make human uh, concepts seem so, uh, you know, simple. It, it would seem to me that AI would would pretty much take over. What do From you think? Like a, a creative, like an aspect of like creative work. Yes. Sure. Um, yeah, that's, that's definitely been, you know, that, that is quite, uh, there's definitely some parties out there that are fairly concerned about the imminence of, of that, uh, at least in a number of particular domains. Um, I'm not so convinced. I think that yeah, like, I mean, of course, I, I'm no, maybe no leading expert in the field, then, but, but nonetheless, I mean, I see, like, yes, of course, you know, computers are great at computation, um, and they have shown the applications of computation in a creative regard in, like, some fairly narrow context, mostly around game playing, um, both in games of, like, perfect information, like chess, uh, and checkers and go even most impressively, but um, I think that there there is a leap, there's a potentially a very large leap to be made from even an open-ended, um, or excuse me, from close-ended, very defined systems of input and output, like playing chess or like playing go, um, to to the real world. Um, that that at least gives me some comfort that, that at least maybe in my lifetime, uh, it, it's kind of unlikely that, you know, well, it's hard to say, but will, will AI achieve like human level creativity? Um, you know, I'm not so sure. It's hard to, it's hard to speculate, but, um, you know, if it, I, I guess I'm not so sure where I fall in that camp. Um, to, to be candid. Uh, it's an interesting question. A lot of folks have, a lot of very much people, bright people have a lot of differing opinions. Um, but uh, yeah, if it comes about, I'm not, I'm not so sure. Um, Next up uh, is Sanjay. Sanjay, go ahead. Yes, uh, so um, I have another question. Uh, so in today's world, we, we have, um, a lot of behavior um, that's driven by um, companies, especially uh, financial uh, goals. Uh, most companies expect a, a profit or a quarterly returns. So how do we get um, an increasingly profit motivated world to focus on research and advancements um, that don't always uh, generate a rapid ROI? Right. Um, if I could summarize your, your, your question, it is how do, how do we get, yes, companies to play the long game? Right. Um, and, and I actually think that, yes, yes, there is a lot of, and there probably is excessive focus on the short term in these, in these quarterly earnings reports and such. But I think that you can actually view, you actually view every company on its own, its own sort of lifespan. Is it 10 years old? Is it two years old? Is it 10 years old? Is it 20, 30, 40, 50, et cetera? And, and most companies tend to, yeah, uh, move from an ex exploration phase of creativity, of trying new things, of trying to expand their footprint in a, in a market to an ex, well, exploitation phase. It, this is a metaphor I'm borrowing from computer science, but you know, uh, of basically I have my steady, stable business. I'm not going to try to innovate too much on that. Um, I'm going to just reap the returns of what I've built in the past. Um, but if you take the broader view outside of public markets, where again, I agree that there is a quite that focus on the short term and look at the, 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 the broader economy. I mean, at least in, in the technical domain there, I think that there is, um, there is excessive capital, right? Which is a product of profit uh, that, it, that is, there, there's a quite a bit of capital funding, funding creative, creative exploration in, in, a, in a venture capital uh, long-term frame. And, and, and I think if you do take a close look at some of the thinkers that leading in the field in VC, um, you, you do see, I think, a good amount of long-term thinking and influence there. Um, so 
I'm fairly caught. It's there's also there's there's well there's money to be made. If everybody is looking short term and you're thinking long term, there is the relative advantage there. So folks will accrue out to that line of thought. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jake. Um, now, what we're going to do is we're going to do breakout rooms.